the rest of this month. If you want to turn to Galatians, we're going to start at 3.26. Galatians 3.26. It says there, You were all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child... He is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were, in, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it then that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. You have done me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that could you have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you might be zealous for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always and not just when I am with you. My dear children... For whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, because I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but the son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, O barren woman who bears no children. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have no labor pains, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. And what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And that's our passage today. So, starting in chapter 3, in going through Galatians here, Paul has six arguments that he's making. And he's making these arguments not just because he likes to argue. He's making these arguments because the gospel is at stake. Some people came into Galatia, And they were preaching a different gospel, which Paul says is no gospel at all. And because of that, they were also criticizing Paul. He's not really a real apostle. He's kind of a quasi-apostle, a sort of apostle. 
So Paul goes through great lengths to defend his ministry and his standing as an apostle, and then he starts making his arguments about the content here. So first he says, this is back in chapter 3, they received the Spirit before following the law. So why is now the law possible, or necessary rather, for salvation? And then he says, Abraham was righteous by believing, and that was before circumcision. So how can these people say that you now have to be circumcised to be saved? Abraham was saved before he was circumcised. And then third, God's promise of salvation came before the law. God made a promise before and said, I am going to bless you and your descendants after you, and then circumcision was given. So how is circumcision necessary to the promise? So now, starting with what we read today, argument number four goes through chapter 4, verse 11. Salvation through law is like being slaved under your old pagan gods. If you want to go to this law now, you might as well be going back to your old pagan gods because it's basically the same thing. If you look at verse 3 of chapter 4, So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. He's talking kind of about their old gods. They probably from just what we can tell here, they probably were into astrology a lot and they saw the stars as kind of controlling their destiny. So, you know, horoscopes and stuff like that, even that we have today. So when the stars are lined up, then this is kind of, this is kind of your, your time to do this. So you observe special days and months and seasons and years because some of them carry good luck. Well, the law in the Old Testament observes special days and months and seasons and years too. It also has certain requirements that you have to follow in order to be saved. Then verse 9, But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it then that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Going to this, this law that you use to be saved, you might as well be going back to your pagan gods. Because it's the same thing. You're both, you're, both of them have slavery that they require for your salvation. That makes no sense at all. Do you want to go back to that? These principles, it says, of that former way of life and this law are essentially the same. So he makes this claim here. In Christ, you are not slaves. You are sons of God. You are not slaves. You are sons. So they were now set free and made sons of God. And so why as sons do you want to be slaves? That doesn't make any sense. So salvation by law means that you jump through hoops to earn the right to be saved. And then you have this claim on salvation. I deserve it because I jumped through the hoops in just the right ways. So now, God, you owe me. That's, that's how that line of reasoning works. But salvation by Christ is a little different. It's a lot different, rather. Salvation in Christ means that you show love from gratitude. So it's not that you do nothing, but it's a whole different way of living. You are not slaves, you are sons. Then in verse 12, he starts argument number five, which is actually a little more of an appeal than an argument. In verse 12, it says, I, tell, or I plead with you, brothers, become like me, because I became like you. He's saying, Paul became a Gentile to witness to them as Gentiles. I'll get to what that means, but that's Paul's strategy. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians 9. I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. So he's going into Galatia, and he wants to tell them about Jesus. And he goes in there, okay, these are not Jews. They don't have the law. They don't observe all these festivals and all these ceremonies. So I'm going to go in there. I'm going to tell them about Jesus because that's all that matters. And I'm not going to be observing those things because they don't observe those things. 
I'm going to just tell them about Jesus. I'm going to focus on that, and I'm going to get them to believe in Jesus. That's his strategy. So now he's saying, why do you want to go to this law when I gave that up that law to witness to you? Become like me, because I became like you. I set aside the law. You don't have to go back to it. Come out from under the law as I did when I preached to you, is what he's saying. One of the allegations against him is that, okay, this Paul guy, yeah, he's not really an apostle. He's telling you that he, you just need Jesus, but he's only telling you half the story because really what he's doing is he's going everywhere else and he's telling everybody else that you need Jesus and then you need to be circumcised and do all this other law stuff too. He's telling that to everybody else. He's just not telling it to you because he just wanted to get you to join his, his club and be his converts. So he's not teaching you the whole gospel. So now Paul is saying, if I'm preaching the law elsewhere, why would I not have kept the law when I was with you? If I really believe in this law, then I would have kept it even if when I was with you. But I didn't. Because Christ is all that matters. That, that's him. Just him. And then he gets into this real personal appeal. He talks about how when I came to you, I, I, was, I was sick and I was a big burden to you. You had to take care of me and look after me and take care of my needs and everything. And I was a real burden to you. But you didn't act like I was such a burden. You, you treated me like I was an angel or like I was Christ himself. And you were so joyful. What, what happened to all that? We were such good friends and suddenly I'm your enemy. What happened here? If you, if you had this friend and you're really close, you're good friends, you do things together, you enjoy each other's company, you share, each other's, you share, share secrets and other things like that, and then there's this third person who comes to you and says, yeah, this friend that you have is not your friend at all. Let me tell you what this friend says about you behind your back. Okay, if that happened to you, would you automatically say, well, my friend must not be a friend at all? Would you automatically conclude that? Or would you first go to that friend and say, hey, I heard that you're saying this and this and this behind my back. Wouldn't you go to that friend first before you suddenly gave up on that friend? That's what Paul's saying here. Hey, we were close. We were good friends. And now suddenly you're turning on me because somebody else said something about me? That's not how it's supposed to work. So they treated Paul so well, and now he's acting like, there, he seems like he's their enemy. Verses 19 and 20, when I read that, it almost feels like Paul's shedding tears as he's writing this. Like he's deeply hurt. So 19 and 20, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. I, I, I don't get it. What happened here? He loves these people. They were close. They were good friends. And now it's like they're enemies. Paul loves those believers and it pains him that they are led astray. Paul just doesn't go into a place and say, oh, here's Jesus Christ. Oh, good, you believe and now I'm out of here. It's not like that. He has a personal connection to all of these people that he witnesses to. A deep personal connection. He's not just trying to win converts and make check marks somewhere in a book. These are all people that he loves and cares for. And so if they start to backslide and start to think, well, I got to follow the law in order to be saved, Paul gets mad. No! We're going to get to more of his mad stuff later on. It's almost kind of, kind of funny even sometimes, but he gets really angry because the gospel's at stake and the people 
that he loves, their salvation is at stake. And then the argument six, argument number six is the last part there when he talks about Hagar and Sarah. These agitator people, these people who are stirring up this trouble, were he saying, probably, from what we can tell anyway, they were using this story to say that the Gentiles, you're under Hagar. And so therefore, you need to become like Isaac, not only be circumcised, but you have to follow all of these laws so that you can be like Isaac and to be under that line as opposed to being the slave. You can be sons if you follow the law and become like him. Something like that. So Paul's saying, okay, yeah, that story about Sarah and Hagar, okay, yeah, that, there's that story, but the conclusion there is all wrong. The story of Sarah and Hagar shows that you are free from the old law, not that you need to be under it. It says, actually, that you are free from it. So Hagar had Ishmael. Ishmael was born because Abraham and Sarah knew that God had promised them a child, and it was taking a while. And so they thought, well, well, maybe, maybe, you need to, maybe you need to take another wife in order to have this child that God promised. So they were taking matters into their own hands. God needs a little help to carry out his promise. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to help God along a little bit. Kind of a salvation by works sort of a thing, which is Paul's trying to get away from. And then Isaac was born, and he was born simply because God had made a promise. And so Abraham and Sarah had Isaac when they were 90s, in their 90s or 100. So trying to earn your salvation by law is slavery. If you are in Christ, you are descended from Isaac. You are descendant of Isaac. You don't need to try to be like him. If you are in Christ, you are a descendant of Isaac already. That's what he's saying. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. You don't have to try to be like that. You already are in Christ. I really like that line. If, you, if you're a part of Christ, you know, like we said a moment ago, I belong body and soul and life and death to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are in Abraham's line and you are heirs to everything God promised Abraham. You were a part of that already. You don't have to try to be like that to be it. You already are. Five hundred years ago, we kind of got away from this gospel. And if, if we as a church were 500 years ago, things would be a little different around here. 500 years ago, death was everywhere. There was disease. There was a lot of warfare. There was poor hygiene. And so you were pretty much living with death constantly. You were lucky to make it to your fifth birthday. And then once you did make it to your fifth birthday, you were staring at all kinds of disease and warfare and death. So you were thinking about your eternity a lot. It's not like today where most of us live to be 80. You were looking at death a lot. And so you were thinking about your eternity a lot. So 500 years ago, going to heaven meant earning merits through the church. People thought that they had to be saved by earning merits through the church. So if this was 500 years ago and I was your priest, you would have to come and confess your sins to me, and then I would say, be forgiven, and then you would be forgiven. At least this is how they thought. You would need the sacraments to be saved. We believe that baptism is a sign and seal, of God's promises to us. Back then, we would have believed that the water actually washed away sin, like it was magic water or something. And so you had to be baptized because that actually took away sins. That meant salvation. 
And because you might die soon, you wanted to get baptized right away, as soon as you were born. For sins, like when you come and confess your sins to me, if it was a particularly mortal sin, then I would say, okay, you got to say this many Hail Marys, and you got to do this many good deeds, and you got to give this much to people in need, and other things like that. You have to make up for what you did wrong. And before heaven, but this was 500 years ago and I was preaching to you back then, I'd be telling you that, okay, yeah, when you die, you get to go to heaven, but, but there's all this sin that hasn't been forgiven yet, and so you have to go to purgatory before you get to heaven so that all that sin can be cleansed. And I would also be telling you that you need to pray to Mary and to pray to the saints so that you could have additional people praying on your behalf to God. And I would be trying to sell you indulgences so that you could reduce your purgatory time. It was all merit-based salvation. Grace was somewhere underneath there. Christ was somewhere underneath there. But in order to get to that, you had to do all of these things. So one of the lessons of the Reformation, solo Christo, in Christ alone. We are saved in Christ alone. So the key verse that we read today, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, because of what he has done. We are saved in Christ alone. So this means a lot of things. It means at least four things. First, He is the only salvation. There's no other way to be saved. There's no other way to be right with God, to get to Him. In Acts 4 verse 12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Christ is the only way to the only God. In our Belgic Confession, it actually says this, To say that Christ is not enough, but that something else is needed as well, is a most enormous blasphemy against God, for then it would follow that Jesus Christ is only half a Savior. Either He saved us all the way, or He's only half a Savior. So He is the only way to God. Number two, he is the only way to be right with God. So we need access to God, but once we have that access, we need to be able to be able to stand before him clean and holy and righteous because God is a holy God and doesn't doesn't allow for sin. Just like we don't put garbage along with food on our dinner table. That's gross. Who does that? Nobody. God doesn't allow sin in his presence either. So without Christ, we stand condemned. With Christ, we stand before God perfectly righteous as if we had done everything perfectly right as Christ has done for us. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne, as it says in one song. John 3.18 Whoever believes in him, that's Jesus, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. We need him. He's the only way. And to stand before God, we need him. Let's look at the screen here and let's answer this together. Do those who look for salvation and security in saints, in themselves, or elsewhere really believe in the only Savior, Jesus? No, although they boast of being his, by their deeds they deny the only Savior and Deliverer, Jesus. Either Jesus is not a perfect Savior, or those who in true faith accept this Savior have in him all they need for their salvation. I like that part. We have in him all we need for our salvation. Christ alone. Number three, he is the only mediator between us and God. He's the only one who goes before us. In fact, in Hebrews, 
It talks about how Jesus is constantly interceding for us on our behalf in heaven before the Father. So, in other words, I don't dispense salvation to you through confession or sacraments or by buying indulgences or anything like that. Salvation is not in my hands to give to you. I am not a mediator between you and Christ or you and God at all. We have one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. And He's all that we need. We don't need anyone else. Now, in Christ through the Spirit, there is a priesthood of all believers, is what we call it. A priesthood of all believers. So that means that all of us are ministers. In the Bible, it talks about how God has given His gifts to everyone in the church so that we all can build each other up and be of help and service to one another. So I hope that you are identifying your gift and using it to be a blessing to people around you here, people in this room. Because that's what it's supposed to be. It's not like I'm the only one with gifts and I'm just helping all of you and you come to me for your salvation. No, the Spirit works through all of us and gives all of us gifts so that we can all build each other up. If this place, if this church had to depend on me to run everything, boy, this place would fall apart real fast. There's a lot of people who do a lot of things around here and I'm very grateful to all of you because this church could not run if it was just me. So in Christ through the Spirit, we have a priesthood of all believers. We don't need priests to go to God for us. Now God does call some of us to lead, some of us to be you know, pastors and leaders and so forth. But it says to each one a manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So if you are a Christian, you are a minister of Jesus. And it still says this on our bulletins too. On the front, it says, Pastor, Reverend Aaron Vreesman, that's me. Ministers, all the members. I want to remind you of that. And that's because we are a priesthood of all believers. We all minister to each other. So, if you have somebody, and they're, they've come to you, and they're talking about something that they did that was just really wrong, and they're feeling really terrible about that, I... I can't believe I did that. That was, that was so terrible. I can't believe I said that. That hurt this person so deeply. And, and even though it was a long time ago, even though I, said, even though I uh, said I was sorry, I just still feel terrible about it. You can say to them, God forgives you. You don't need to be a priest to say that. You are forgiven in Jesus' name. And we need to hear that. We all need to hear that from one another. You are forgiven in the name of Jesus in Christ alone. Number four, he is the only way to be a child of God. Being a child of God is not a right. It's a privilege. And we have that through Christ. We are not naturally God's children. By nature, we are God's enemies. We sin against Him. We reject Him. We want things our way. We don't submit to God or what God says. By nature, we are God's enemies, but God has made us His children. John 1, 12 and 13. This is on the screen here. To all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. Believers are children of God. Not by nature, but because they believe, because of Christ. So if you are in Christ, then you are a child of God. And we need this reminder. So affirming Christ alone means that those who reject Christ are not saved. We need to reach them. We need to tell them that you need Christ. You need Christ to be able to go to heaven, to be right with God. To know God, you need Christ. To pray to God, you need Christ. 
to have hope for the future, you need Christ. We need to be witnesses. Last week was mission emphasis. Christ is the only way. So we need to tell people about him. Being religiously devoted to anything else besides Christ is a denial of Christ alone. And this is where, this is where I, I need to hear a challenge here. I don't know about you. There are routines that we follow every day. There are things that we think that we need every day. And so we can be easily devoted to the food that we eat, the coffee we drink, the people we see, the phones that we hold. We can be religiously devoted to these things. We depend on them. We think that we need them. But if we are more devoted to anything else besides our connection to Christ and our connection to God through Christ, then we are denying that we are saved by Christ alone. If we think that we need these things and we are more devoted to these things more than Christ, then we are denying Christ alone. We're saying, I need Christ, but then these other things too. So we have our routines and and that's great. But Christ is all you need. There's a discipline that goes back a long ways. It's called fasting. And the reason for that discipline is to remind us what we really need. This very day, Christ alone is everything that you are looking for in life. It's everything you're looking for. It's everything I'm looking for. We do a lot of running around, trying to chase things, trying to make things happen. We're we're looking for stuff out of life. We put in a lot of effort and a lot of worry to get what we're looking for. I'm telling you today that Christ alone is everything that you are looking for in life. Everything. This, This other stuff, this is luxuries. It's nice stuff, sure, but Christ alone is everything that you need. He offers you heavenly love beyond any romantic love that you could want here. He offers you belonging. That means you are sons of God in Jesus Christ. You belong to God. He offers you intimacy. In Him we cry, Abba, Father. And He knows you better than you know yourself. He offers you purpose. You're a child of Abraham. You are a part of God's design divine plan to redeem the world. He offers you peace. Nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing. You belong to him forever. He offers you confidence. You are clothed with Christ. You can stand before God without shame. You actually need him more than you need food. As it says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's a slogan in this advertisement that's on DTE energy, know your own power. I'm telling you today, know your own Savior. Everything your heart desires is Christ alone. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you? Christ alone. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray that we would come to know your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that, Lord, we would know him more so that we would know you more. And that, Lord, we would come to realize that everything that we need, everything that we want, is actually Christ alone. Lord, help us to discover that. In Jesus' name, amen.